when you come here and you climb, as soon as you touch the wall until you pop out of the top, it's game on. It doesn't let off. If you picture a volcano erupting, blowing ash and rocks into the sky, and now as that whole cloud settles, that's what created this area. My name is Simeon Heimwitz. I've been climbing since 1996. So this is a professional rock climbing guide. I'm the owner of Southern Exposure Climbing School and Guide Service. I've been developing routes in Mexico since 2003. I've developed routes all over the United States too, from Pennsylvania to New York, down to New River Gorge, Kentucky. I've developed routes out in Las Vegas. I've lived in Las Vegas for years, so I've been all over the place. The guidebooks that I've written were for the Potrero, and then I've written guidebooks for Down By Me. The wonderful thing about writing a guidebook is you really get to understand an area because I'm going from route to route and just making sure that all the information is accurate and making it accessible for people. The nonprofit all the way in the bottom, that's for young adults with autism. I started a nonprofit here in Mexico because children, young adults with autism, it's different when you're rock climbing because kids with autism, when they touch the rock, there's no difference between them and anybody else. And some of the hurdles with autism is that the children know that something's up. It's not like they're just wandering through life thinking that everything's right and good in the world. They know that things, that there's challenges. And in Mexico, if I could take young adults out climbing and introduce them to rock climbing and show them that once they touch the rock, that they have the same fears and the same challenges. And then when they get through rock climbs, we all celebrate together. It's really like any other child, any other young adult. And that not-for-profit is more for connecting parents. Because if I can teach parents of children with autism how to set up climbs and how to get out there and set up top ropes, then when these parents become friends and they take their children rock climbing, they're in the outdoors and they can just take their kids rock climbing. It isn't really about autism. So that's, you know, it's really important to me as far as I'm going to leave a legacy in this world. The two books that I wrote, La Concepcion, that's the rhyolite crack climbing right near my house. They're in Aculco de Espinosa. And then Peña de Bernal. These are the two areas that are right near my house. And then Helotepec is the third area, which isn't in, I didn't write a book for that. There's a book that's written. I'm trying to, hard to get a hold of it and seeing about putting these uh, La Concepcion and Peña de Bernal also on rack up. They aren't actually physically printed. I've printed books in the past and it's just, you know, with the future, it seems that digital is a really great way to go. The two books on the right are for Northern Mexico and Southern Mexico. A friend of mine put those out. They're about 10 years old now. They're a fantastic book to have on Mexico. If you were to buy books on the whole entire country, those would be the two books that you were gonna buy. They're outdated, the information is old, but the directions to get to these places is accurate and the pictures in those books are magnificent. They did a great job putting them together. What we'll be covering, climbing in Central Mexico, the logistics of climbing in Central Mexico, getting around, the local culture there, rest day activities. The first thing I'm gonna show everybody is Monterrey in the north is where I had my house in the Potrero. That's about four and a half hours south of Laredo, Texas. Where I am now is the three areas that you see in the south, La Concepcion, Peña de Bernal, and Las Peñas de Dexcani. Those are the three areas that are close to my house. Are they by any means the only areas? No, there's 17 different areas be, be, uh, within three hours of my house that cover all those would be, and we would need a whole lot more than an hour. But these areas are right near my house. They're world-class areas. And I just wanna give you guys an idea of where exactly comparatively where I am to Northern Mexico. As you can see in this picture, the color differences from Monterrey, it's brown. And where I am down by me, there's a lot of green. That's because you're driving from Monterrey down through the desert of Chihuahua through Saltillo, down through the desert of Chihuahua, and you're coming up onto the Altiplano to get to where I live. My house in Aculco is at 8,700 feet in elevation. These are very high elevation places. It's 75 degrees every day. So it's a very nice place because the air is always fresh. It's always warm. And 
is mountainous and green. I just wanted to, you know, kind of point that out because people don't really understand the difference between the north and the south of, of Mexico. And I just want to give people a little bit more background than just the rock climbing. Here's another map just showing the difference between the two from Monterrey and where the Potrero is to my house in Acluco de Espinosa. That gives you an idea if you're going to fly in. People ask me about Mexico City because my house is close to Mexico City, but it actually is a lot easier to fly into the airport in Querétaro. It's a state and it's also a city. So when people wanna fly in, that international airport in Querétaro is beautiful because it's not a huge airport. It lies outside of the city, the east side of the city. So you're not anywhere near the city. And to get out of that airport, get into a rental car that costs you all of $86 for a week, you can drive right to Peña de Bernal in 25 minutes. Takes me 30 because I drive really slow, but other people make it between 20 and 30 minutes. Very easy drive. One road takes you right out to the monolith. My house from Peña de Bernal is about an hour and five minutes to get from one to the other. Very easy drive that right back down 57D. And then Las Peñas de Dexcani is south of me by 50 minutes. So I have three areas that are very, really close to my house. And this, you also see San Juan del Rio. And that's the nearest town to me, which is, you know, for going shopping and things like that. And then Tolentango, Tolentango is a place that we'll talk about here in a little while too. So I try to put it on the map to give people an idea. The reason why I listed Valle de Bravo, because Valle de Bravo is a huge area, world-class, for paragliders. So now more and more than ever, rock climbers are crossing over into paragliding. And I just want to give people an idea that from where I live, the Valle de Bravo, which is a wonderful place to go if you've never been there. It's a lake and it's just beautiful scenery. Everything there is just absolutely gorgeous. So that just gives a little bit more background information. And from my place in Aculco to get the Valle de Bravo, it's a little over two hours, depending on what time you go. It could be up to three hours, depending on what time you want to drive. But it's a, another, again, it's an easy drive. There are the three areas again, Peña de Renal, Cascada de la Concepción, and then Peña de Dexcani. So let's get started. Peña de Bernal, that right there is a 1,700-foot monolith. That monolith, is a porphyritic granite. It's a granite monolith. There are trad climbs and sport climbs on this monolith, but I really suggest for people just to climb the sport lines because when I get going on these trad lines, they're very dirty. They could be run out and let's just wait on the trad lines. Let me get back there with my buddies and start climbing these things again and see exactly what goes on. That's a beautiful granitic, this is the north face of it. Why I call it porphyritic is because the grains on this are so small. It's not like a granite that you've seen before. It's a volcanic plug from a volcano that's north, two hours north. And the way that this comes out of the earth, there's no way to get on top of this monolith unless you're rock climbing. That is the pen, is that's the Bernal side. What we were just looking at, which I can click back, that's the south side, that's the north side. There are four sides to this monolith, so you could run around and you could find shade all day. To walk around the monolith completely, I don't know, probably an hour. As you can see in this picture on the left, you can see that there's actually a hiking trail. And that hiking trail that you see on the left goes all the way up and you can see where it stops in that bowl over to the right. And what makes this place great is that on the right-hand side, you can see the multi-pitch routes that kind of match up to the left edge of the monolith over left. That's the same picture, the same you know routes that are going up that flat wall to the left. And the nice part is that you can do a seven or nine pitch climb, walk over the top, hook over and down and around and do a long rappel and a short rappel and be down within 15 minutes and hook up at that hiking trail and hike your way all the way back down. There's a lot to be said for being able to climb on this side doing nine pitch routes or on the other side doing 13 pitch routes and being able to wrap off in less than 15 minutes. 
for anybody that's done anything that's long and having to wrap the line or any type of long descent, I can't tell you how much easier it is. You, in the time that it takes me to get off that route and walk back down, you wouldn't even be three pitches down in other areas, four pitches, and we're already drinking beers down at the local restaurant, which is right down at the bottom of the hill, very conveniently located at the bottom of this hill. So that's a porphyritic granite. In the background to the right, you can see the Sierra Gorda Mountains. This area lies right on the edge of the Sierra Gordas. So when we start talking about different areas here, you have to understand that this monolith, if you drove into the mountains about 35, 40 minutes and you get into the Sierra Gordas, it isn't too long until it turns into rainforest. Hard to believe, but the mountains are big enough that the eastern slope turns the rainforest and there's lots and lots of water. That would be the east side, lots of routes over here as well. And again, with rack up, if you downloaded the app, you could see all the routes that are on this. And there's also a lot of room for route development. And for me, being a developer, having that access to such steep stone that hasn't been touched is also a huge draw. Yeah, you know, lots of history here. I'm gonna bounce back one more second. So there's a Via Ferrata that is right here where this plateau is. This is where we wrap down and we wrap down right over a Via Ferrata that comes right down to this base. This is the memorial wall right here. There's routes on this wall. And uh, I've actually put up a multi-pitch that goes all the way up to the top here. Great multi-pitch doesn't get a whole, done a whole lot because it's hard, but I mean, it will in time as people catch on to the fact that it's really bolted well, even though it is hard, it's bolted well. So back to this Via Ferrata, 1922 is when they put this Via Ferrata up. And when people talk about doing Via Ferratas, I'm like, yeah, this was a little bit different than Via Ferratas you might be used to because this baby's got moves. And you have, I can't really understand what I'm talking about, but when you get up there and you start going from iron rung to iron rung and you see the distance between them, it is. It's very, very interesting for 1922 in Mexico to have something so what would be modern because it's the only way to get up there is by climbing. Now again, there's the eastern, eastern wall. And then again, this is the north side. And here I have pictures that are taken directly from the, uh, app, the, from the app and from the book that I wrote. And this shows actually just one edge of the monolith. And it gives you all the different routes here. There's single pitch routes, there's multi-pitch routes. And then it shows the trad routes that I put in red that go up these different lines up the cracks. And as I've stated, as I've tried to do actually a number of these trad routes, some go on big gear, some you get started and they're so clogged with debris and such that we back off because, you know, I just, we, to, to go up there and do these things is a whole job in itself to make sure all the accurate, everything's accurate. That right there is the west side. This is the largest concentration of hard rock climbing here at Peña de Bernal, 13s and 12s are all over this. I show just a few of the routes here in this picture, but there are numerous routes. And this route, which I'm gonna take this, the, the cursor that goes up this face and it hooks up with this ridge. That's the Filo, Noro Occidental, that's the Northeast Ridge. And that I think is seven pitches, eight pitches right here. And I would consider this one to be a moderate because there's two, five, nine pitches. And then by the time you hit the ridge, and if you've never done a ridge climb, it is quite exciting. I like to do it for guiding because a lot of people have never been on a razor blade ridge. I could show you pictures of that ridge and you'll get an idea of exactly what's going on, but it's a lot more fun just to take people up there and have them experience for themselves. The culture in the town. Bernal is a Pueblo Magico, a magic town in Mexico. That's a coveted type of uh, town for a status because there's got to be something in these towns that makes it really special. Here in Bernal, that's that monolith. The town is gorgeous. It's not like other towns uh, that you might think of when you see pictures of Mexico or movies of Mexico and things and such. This is like nothing you've ever seen. It's got, it has beautiful restaurants. It's got shopping. It's got all sorts of cool stuff in it that you could spend a day if you climb and maybe your husband doesn't if you bring the kids and you want something to do the wine and cheese tour in this area is fantastic 
And just hanging out in town is an experience all in itself. They have museums in this town. Like I said, it's just, you know, it's very nice. On the right-hand side, the lady that's called a skeet base. And a skeet base is a type of corn dish. And this woman has that all wrapped up. I think she's got seven different kinds of corn that she has out there all day. Whether you want to eat corn on the cob or whether you want it in a cup, it really is amazing. There's another picture of Bernal on the left. Gives you an idea how nice this town is. You know, that's a restaurant right there. That, that's what their menu is. And as you go down the line, there's lots of different, different restaurants in here and they all have their specialties. Aculco de Espinosa. This is the town that I live in. This picture is the river that runs down into the crag. So you're actually going down and in when you climb here. The cliff that you can't see in the background there that is kind of uh, obscured by this waterfall, that's 30 meters tall, 30 meters of fun. With this river, it's very green in this area. You can see the cows here grazing on the river and you see the gentleman in the background that's Jesus over in the left-hand side. And that day that I took that picture, Jesus was actually going around and picking up any garbage in the area. These are milk cows. This is a very dairy rich area. So my town of Aculco de Espinosa is also a Pueblo Mexico, but it's because of the church in my town. Miguel Hidalgo got held up there during the Mexicans, when he was with the Mexicans, having them rise up against the Spanish. He said that the Mexica, the people of Mexico should be being treated better than what the Spanish, how they were treating them. So they rose up and had their little revolution and he got caught in my town and uh, was held up there. He couldn't leave and he was at the monastery there at the, next to the church. And that's what makes my town very uh, culturally rich. It's a dairy town. If you like cheese, homemade cheese, homemade ice cream, and homemade pastries, that's what my town is all about. It's all about uh, dairy. When they say aculco, that word literally means where the water knots. And why they say that is because they have agua dulce, which is the sweet water. Then they have agua agria, which is the sour water. So for whatever reason, which I really can't get a, actually a solid answer on it, they do have drinking water there because we have wells in the town that supply everybody, very good water in my town. And they also have water that they just use for cleaning things and clothes and things like that, that people don't drink. And they call that water the sour water. They call it salt water. They say it's salty and they say it's volcanic flows of water underneath the earth and that it's not drinkable. In the background, again, with this picture on the left, that gentleman right there is a bona fide cowboy because people in my town who are riding horses do not have cars. He's taking his dairy cows across this lake. That right there is Peña de Ñado in the background. So I showed you that in the first picture. That gives you another vantage point of it. This mountain right here is Ñado, the stone-faced mountain. And to circumnavigate this mountain, the peak of this mountain behind it is actually the peak, you can't see it here, is 11,000 feet in elevation. To hike this ridge, to get up to the top of this mountain, which is behind it is the actual summit, you can't see it from here, is a, actually is a gorgeous day of hiking. This picture over here is looking down from the top, looking back down at Aculco, which is the town that I live in, it's right down here. And that's Peña de Bernal, looking at it from above. It really is. A wonderful place to go hang out to get to 11,000 feet. It takes about three hours to hike up there and about 40 hours, 45 minutes to hike back down. So it's a wonderful day hike. These trees that you see all over this mountain, these are live oak. These are huge trees that are protected. They can't be coming in and cutting these trees. They uh, are part of reserve there. And they're the hardest tree, hardest oak that is known you know, as far as white oak, red oak, pin oak, all the different type of oak trees out there, chickpea oak, there's a lot of different types of oak. This live oak is a very hard oak tree. They also call it Spanish oak. And that's because when the Spanish came and they cut down these trees and they sent them back to Spain, they would build battleships out of them. And the reason they did that is because they were very smart. 
instead of lofting cannonballs at each other when they were back in the 1500s, they would just take that battleship, they would point it at the other ship, and they would just run right into it and sink it that way. You know, it's just gorgeous there. Again, just fields. It's all agriculture here. It's volcanic. Everything's volcanic. We have the rhyolite where we're climbing, the granitic, the porphyritic granite, that's up in Bernal, and then Halotepec is an overhanging volcanic tuff. So that these are all volcanic rocks, volcanic soil, which makes the soil very rich. These farmers, again, are all Otomi, and they do not have cars. These people all have taxis that bring them back and forth to work, I mean, back and forth to the uh, town. I would say, as far as the farmers go, maybe 10% of them have vehicles. 90% of them take the taxis back and forth. They now turn their ground over with tractors, but even with the tractors turning the ground over, they only turn over maybe 20% of the earth with tractors. Everything else is done with horses, mules, burrows. They're turning the over with, with, with you know, livestock again. They're turning over this land. So it really, as far as the agriculture goes here, this goes back to the United States right after World War I, before World War II, when the Industrial Revolution was happening. This is, the, you know, this is pretty much the same date because these guys harvest everything by hand. It really is pretty amazing. On the right is a picture of the sunset here at 8,000 feet, almost 9,000 feet. The sunsets here are just magnificent. Every night when the sun goes down with the restaurants in my town, they open up all the windows because it's 75 degrees every day and you just watch the sunset and it really is spectacular each evening. Cascadas de Aculco, Cascadas de la Concepcion, the birthplace of the water is what they're saying. This is a great picture that I took with my drone that I had in the air, and it gives you an idea of exactly the size of this place. All of these cliffs over here, about 50 meters tall, then it goes from 50 meters around the corner, and it goes to about 25 meters to 30 meters to 32 meters with all these climbs, and then it breaks back down to 25 meters over on this. There's climbing all around, but the majority of the climbing is all through here. For me, I've probably done 40% of the climbs in this area, one by one, cleaning them, making sure that they're the grade that they say. Maybe I've done 50%, and I'm just slowly but surely going back through all these climbs and making sure that everything's accurate. So that way, when people come to town, they know what they're getting on. When I first visited this area, I climbed here three or four times, and we didn't even have a guidebook. And, you know, that's a pretty wonderful way to look at things because looking up at cracks, you can kind of see the size of the crack. And then you can judge from there if it's hands, if it's fingers, if it's off with what you think you're getting involved with. So it really is an incredible place. And you can see all of the live oaks that are down in the valley here and the river, the waterfall is right here where you saw the picture of the cows and Jesus. And then the water comes down through, comes around, and then exit over on this side. Goes all the way down to a reservoir. That's where the river runs to. This is a beautiful place to climb because you're in the shade all day. If you're, depending on where you're climbing, you can find sun if you want it. But for the most part, we climb in the shade all day. And again, 75 degrees in the shade, crack climbing. I can't, you know, I can't really put into words how beautiful that is, especially if you're used to climbing in the hot sun. That's La Proa again, and here again, that's Peña de Ñado in the background. So that gives you an idea of how this is all laid out. There's the waterfall. This time of year when I took that picture, the waterfall is just what they would consider to be barely running. They have a rainy season that starts there right around April, and it goes through September. And that rainy season right around 4 o'clock, 4.30 every afternoon, somewhere between 4.30 and 6, it rains every day. That's where the agriculture comes in. They know the rains are coming, they plant their fields, and that waterfall rages in the summertime. It's just raging. It's really a, quite a beautiful place to climb. Very, the tranquility there is what it's all about because you have the river running past the climbs. You have the trees that shade you. It's just beautiful. Another picture of the La Proa, and that's where the majority of the moderates are. The way that crab climbing works, especially with rhyolite or basalt, is that 
when the rock cools, it fractures to a certain size. And these fractures at this canyon are really 510. 510 is the number here. There's five nines, there's five eights, there's five sevens, there's you know five elevens and five twelves. But five ten is really the grade. For five ten crack climbing, that's really a grade where people with smaller hands can get into it because they can get into a rattly finger situation for somebody with my hands. And then somebody with bigger hands can climb five ten here and get into a wider crack, and everybody can really dial in their crack climbing skills. This place really puts the boots to people because it's vertical crack climbing. Your feet are in the crack maybe 5% of the time, if not less. It's very technical, so it's technique driven. No two cracks are alike. So when you come here and you climb, as soon as you touch the wall until you pop out of the top, it's game on. It doesn't let off. Very few of these climbs have a stance in between. So you have 30 meters of climbing. When I tell people this is world-class crack climbing and that each climb has stars on it for as far as quality grades, the reason why they're quality is because the second that you start this fight, because it's a blue collar brawl for the time you get to the top, it's not gonna let up. If you stop trying, you're gonna start falling. And that makes it a very special place to climb. There's a good friend of mine, Sam. He's on a 511. That 511 is as world-class as you can possibly get. It goes from hands to fingers. And then at the top, it's got a mystery move at the very top that people aren't expecting. And it is just a really wonderful climb. That is one of the ones that if people come here traveling and they ask me what climbs they should get on, that would be one of the climbs that I would say. And on the right again, is with the rack up app that I put together, it gives you all the lines of where the routes are. And with crack climbing, it's really straightforward because, you know, if you can't figure it out with just, you know, following a vertical crack, we got, we got bigger problems. Yeah, it's just really, really straightforward. Labyrinthino, the labyrinth. On the left, you can see that I have a circle. And that is just to give you kind of an idea of how big the place is. Because that little circle is giving you what the climb is on the right. And that climb is overhanging. 5, 10 plus off with. And when people tell me they love the wide, I'm like, well, let's come over here and see that and, and look at that one. And when people stand underneath this climb and they look up on it, they start to shake because that thing is so mean and it's got great gear. Anytime you want to stop and put gear in, you can put gear any way you want on that baby, but it's mean because it's overhanging off with. There's more pictures of it again with the guidebook. It gives you the variations and it shows you with the left, you can see the overhanging nature of it with the roof stuck in the middle up high. And then on the right, you can see the original route and then they call this a variation to go up through the overhanging loft. But wonderful climbing, but yeah, not for the faint of heart. If you're looking for the wide, that's it right there. There's Shawnee right there. We were doing a little bit of artistic stuff out there with their violin. And you can see your hand placed across that crack. And you see on either side of that crack, there's nothing waiting for you. Yeah, that's off with. Yeah, people say they like the wide. I bring them right over there. I'm like, how about that one? It is a wonderful climb. And then on the right again, there's more climbing. You can see every four feet, there's a different crack. And each one of those cracks is a different climb. And it's quite a concentration of hard climbing here. That's the tail end where the river exits the canyon. And looking out, you could see that it's endless amounts of first descent potential. When you look down into this valley, depending on how far you want to walk, it's going to dictate how much you want to develop and how much climbing you want to do. When people come to visit and they want to go for a nice rest day hike, we come to the canyon and I tell them just to follow the river all the way down to the reservoir because there's trails down there because people are grazing their cows and their sheep down in that valley. So there's trails everywhere. And I say, just walk on out to the reservoir. Then when you get done, pop up on top and then just walk the top all the way back. So that way it gives you two different vantage points in this valley. It's very green. It's very beautiful here. The girl on the right, that's Otomi. That's their typical garb. And they come and they sell things at the canyon and everything that they make, they're making themselves. You know, it's all handmade goods. On the left, our gentlemen that have a truck 
a farmer. They were moving that. And what brings me to Mexico is that right there. Just the idea that people can pretty much do whatever they want. You know, I mean, it's just a farming area and that's pretty much the norm. So I just love it there. These two pictures I just came upon by accident with a buddy of mine, Steve. And these were etched in there a very, very long time ago. They're very old. And that when you're walking along the reservoir and you go up underneath these, uh, what would be rock houses, if you're familiar with Kentucky or different areas that are similar, where you have huge overhanging sections of rock where the natives would have gone and been living to get out of the rain, these stone drawings are underneath these, you know, rock outcroppings or rock house. And when I tell people on your hiking, when I send them out to the reservoir, I tell them to hook in and walk as close to the cliff as you possibly can. We just wandered upon these. If this was in the United States, these bad boys would have been protected a long time ago. In Mexico, they'll catch up. And hopefully when they do decide to, you know, do a little bit more as far as protecting things like these, this stuff will be protected as well because they really are. So look into the past. I mean, this is amazing. The next area that we're going to talk about is Las Peñas de Dixcani. That is at 10,500 feet in altitude. That is the largest collection of hard rock climbing in Mexico. The hardest climbs in Mexico are in this area. There's a few 14s in there, and this is overhanging volcanic tuff. It really is another easy hike to get up on top of the place to see it from this vantage point. And again, this is the largest collection of protected live oak in all of Mexico that surrounds this area. This is a private preserve. It's a $3 entrance fee to get in here. The Ejido, the farmers union that owns it, are very particular about keeping it beautiful because this is, again, another tourist location. People come here to see this area because it is naturally for mountain bikers and for hikers and for rock climbers. This is a pretty stellar area because you can, you could spend the whole day walking around the shade. And for anybody that knows if they've ever traveled in Mexico, shade is definitely a commodity in this country. And the climbing here is Pinnacles, as you can see on the left, and that's a freestanding tower. You can see the cobbles hanging out of this. When you look at it at first, it looks like solidified mud, and you're pretty much accurate because it's solidified ash. If you picture a volcano erupting, blowing ash and rocks into the sky, and now as that whole cloud settles, that's what created this area. These routes are anywhere from 12 meters up to 30 meters tall. There's a few handful of multi-pitch climbs that are two pitches, but not too many people do the two-pitch climbs here. For the most part, it's single-pitch sport climbing. For the guide service, we do a lot of climbing school here because of the single pitch overhanging nature. It really is a great place to go and learn how to sport climb safely. It's when you fall off, similar to Kentucky, there's nothing really there to hit. Another picture on the left, there's you can see the person climbing. And then to the left of them, that's called Godzilla's Egg. And that's where the hardest climbs in Mexico are right on this formation. And then you see the other gentleman on the horses. And that's quite common in this area. Again, these were all farmers. This was a Sunday and they took their rest day. They got on their horses and they rode up here to Las Peñas de Dexcani just to hang out for the day. On the right hand side, you can see myself playing my buddy Mark. And that's where the collection of 512s, 513s and 514s are all on this wall right here. There's lots of hard climbing in this area, but as far as the overhanging hard stuff, this is where they filmed the 2010 Petzl rock trip or a part of it. They filmed it right here in Halotepec and these were the climbs that they were doing. It really is a very interesting area. Overhanging volcanic tuff. It's almost like you're climbing in an indoor gym, but you're outside because you're going, you're latching a hold of cobbles. Some of the cobbles are no bigger than two fingers on a pinch. Other cobbles are as big as a Volkswagen bus that are all welded right into the wall. So it really is pretty amazing climbing. This is the National Park El Chico. I didn't mention this in the three areas that we guide, but I wanted to let people know that this is here because as we go through, we talk about culture and things, and we're going to talk about rest day activities. This is the first national park in Mexico. Those cliffs in the background and those spires that you see way in the back, that's up to seven pitches tall, and that's the same rock as Halotepec. It is an absolutely magnificent place to go visit. And as far as I know, that's at 11,000 feet right there. 
10 to 11,000 feet again, this national park. It was the original national park in Mexico. Now we're going to come into the good, you know, after the climbing, I wanted to cover these restaurants. That's the Brazilian steakhouse. But right behind those pay phones, that's a coffee shop. And this gives you a little idea of the town that I live in. It's a very beautiful town. That Brazilian steakhouse is pretty much the norm. When people come into town from climbing, we go there for dinner the first night because it's delicious food. And the owners are always there and they're always willing to come and hang out and talk to you about where you're from and what you're doing there. And, you know, if you're having a good time, there's the monolith in the background, Arayan. That's an Italian restaurant, Piave, and that gentleman's from the Dolomites. And he's full on like Italian gentleman from the Dolomites. His whole place is filled with pictures of that part of the world. Not that he was ever a rock climber, but he certainly was from that area. And the Italian food there is magnificent. Arian is a German gentleman that runs a Mexican restaurant. And that is a world-class Mexican restaurant. It's typical of that part of Mexico. And it's really, really delicious food. After the rock climbing, after we get done climbing, what's nice about these areas is that you have beautiful towns and really good food on the cheap. You can have a full dinner with drinks, get done eating, and maybe spend at max $20 American dollars, and you're living like a king. Maison de la Roca, they have their own specialty beers here. That Again, if you look inside that door, it's just a really nice restaurants, nice places to go. These are very family-friendly towns. What differs between the north and the south of Mexico is that in the north, you go there and you're climbing, and you see my name in that guidebook on routes. There are going to be really good routes. I took a lot of time to set up beautiful climbs there. But after the climbing's done, you have very limited options on what you're going to do. And to bring a family to the Potrero, it's really, really hard. And there's our Gorditas. That's right outside the airport. When you leave the airport, you make a left. And that right there is a buffet Gordita place. They put it all together. You just walk in and point at things. They give it to you in and out the door in like two minutes flat. If you spend $4 there, you walk out full. And this is, you know, the best $4 you could possibly spend. Yeah. I love my desserts. Lots and lots of pastel. Lots and lots of pastelerias. Lots of cake places. Lots of places where you can buy all sorts of dessert items. Rest day activities in Central Mexico. Nevado de Toluca. That right there is a national park. That's outside of Toluca, Mexico. And that is looking down into the rim of a crater of a volcano. That's at 14,000 feet right there. What are you going to do on your rest days? Where I live in Mexico, we have the volcanoes as well. To go to this volcano and to hike there, you can do the rim traverse. Nevado de Toluca has their own rim traverse. It takes a whole day. Is that a rest day? Not exactly. Not for me. I would need a rest day for my rest day. But to go up there and to be able to get up to the rim of the crater and look down and see the lake of the sun and of the moon, it really is quite special if you've never been to a volcano before. That right there is in the Sierra Gordas. So when you go into the Sierra Gordas, the eastern side of these mountains is all rainforest. And here is another place, Tolentango, and that is mineral water at 72 degrees. It comes out of the ground, it's a volcanic flow, and this place is absolutely gorgeous. For people who want to bring families down or want to take rest days, I point them in this direction because there's so much to see and so much to do on your rest days with nice hotels in between. And that's Valle de Bravo and paragliding. People who paraglide, that really is a nice place to go. It's world-class because they do cross-country paragliding there. You can take off in one place and land miles and miles and miles away because of the way that the wind forms. So you drive out after you get done climbing and then you can arrive there and then you can spend your rest days there. Dirt bike riding. I also have a dirt bike touring business. People who come down to ride dirt bikes, I can take them out rock climbing, but not a lot of the times when people come down rock climbing, can I set them on one of those dirt bikes? Because if you ask somebody if they know how to ride, that's either a yes or a no answer. And if somebody says they don't ride, that would not be something that you'd want to put them on top of. But people who do know how to ride, riding dirt bikes in my area is wonderful. Yeah, lots of local culture in my town. You can visit the nearby Pueblo Mexicos, you know, Bernal, 
at Culco, San Miguel de Allende is north of us. Mineral del Chico is the national park. There's Valle de Bravo, there's places all around us that not only are beautiful in their own right for the town, but the surrounding areas because of the altitude. Artisanal shops, there's no end. Pyramids that are east of Mexico City. We have hot springs all around us because it's all volcanic. There's caves near us. Some of the largest sinkholes in all of Latin America are right near where I live. And then, of course, in my town with the local cheeses, the ice cream, and the restaurants. Not only lots of stellar rock climbing, but there's also wonderful things to do when you're not. There's the three areas. Bernal, Las Peñas de Dexcani, and Cascadas de Aculco. They are wonderful. And the best part about it is that in a trip, you can hit three completely different areas in one foul swoop. You know, the big wall of Bernal, because it takes all day to climb that monolith. Uh, Las Peñas de Dexcani, which is in that private reserve. And then the crack climbing near my house at La Cascadas de La Concepcion. You know, most people come down as a vacation. With COVID, we're doing, you know, book four days of climbing, which is the three different areas, then a day of doing the big wall, because usually in Bernal, the first day, we'll go out and do single pitch cragging to get everybody up to speed. And then you get one day free. So if people book four, I take people out for the extra day in my time to go crack climbing. Best time of year to climb, it's all year. We're always at 75 degrees. When it gets to 80 degrees in my town, people think it's a heat wave and everybody runs for cover. The way we price it out is $370 per day per guide, and that's up to four people. So four people divided by 370 is like $92 per person per day. The only caveat to that is if we're doing the big wall, there's only one guide per two clients. We can't be pulling four people up a full day climb. That would be pretty tough for everybody, for the climbers as well as the guides. What's included is the rock climbing guides folk day climbing, whatever itinerary you guys want to do. We have all the gear. We have the shoes. We have the harnesses. We have everything, you know, you need to have a good time. All you really have to do is fly in. What's not included is the transportation. I usually push people towards the, you know, $90 rental car for a week. If people don't want to rent the car for a week at the airport, that's okay. We can set up transportation. We can. Accommodations. I get people into hotels, the Airbnbs. I help everybody set that stuff up. Everybody has their own idea of what they want. And then meals and snacks. People who come in, they all have their idea. So for us, it just makes it easier if everybody just gets to, you know, pick their own adventure when it comes to restaurants and things like that. But we set it all up for people. They're coming in. You want us to get you in a really nice four-star hotel? No problem at all. I know where they are. I know the people who own them. <laughs> I hope that I brought forth a different view of Mexico for people. And that everybody can look forward to seeing other places that are, you know, new destinations.